Welcome back, Warrior. We're doing two chapters a day here because this week we have 10, 10 chapters. This is a bad way to signal 10, but we have 10 chapters to read all week. So it's a lot. It's a lot to take to take in, right? Okay, uh, verse or chapter 46. We just read 45. Helaman's now the one in charge writing. Okay, it says Amalekiah conspires to be king. Moroni raises the title of liberty. He. I better put my glasses on. Uh-huh. I have them. Uh, he rallies the people to defend their religion. True believers are called Christians. A remnant of Joseph shall be preserved. Amalekiah and the dissenters. Flee to the land of Nephi. Those who will not support the cause of freedom are put to death. Okay, a lot of things happening here. It's kind of a lot of verses, actually. So, just wanted to give a heads up of what's going on. Okay, so here we go. It says, and it came to pass that as many as would not hearken to the words of Helaman and his brethren were gathered together against their brethren. It's like they do that all the time, you know. And now behold, they were exceedingly wroth in so much that they were determined to slay them. Why is that? People make people feel bad and so then they want to kill them. Now the leader of those who were wroth against their brethren was a large and a strong man. And his name was Amalekiah. Well, of course he was large and strong. He had to be so that people would listen to him. Large, strong, probably was rich. lived in a nice place he's posting all these videos and and pictures of him living his best life on insta you know what i'm saying okay and amalekiah was desirous to be key to be a king of course and those people who were wroth were also desirous that he should be their king and they were why are they wroth because they're ma- they're you know healman's making me feel bad for my choices so i'm mad because I got, I made to feel bad because I didn't think I was, I mean, I could feel it deep down inside that I was doing a bad thing, but it doesn't, it wasn't super bad until Helaman started saying stuff. And now he's trying to make me look bad, right? I got caught. I got caught. Um, and Amalekiah was desirous to be a king. And those people who were wroth were also desirous that he should be their king, right? And they were the greater part of them, the lower judges of the land. And they were seeking for power, of course. Also that still feels like I have like that pill stuck in my throat here. It's weird. Okay. I promise I'm doing okay today. Okay. And they had been led by the flatteries of Amalekiah that if they would support him and establish him to be their king, that he would make them rulers over the people. Of course. People are sucking up to him. Oh, yeah, I'll make you a ruler. Just everything, right? Promises, promises, promises. Empty, empty promises. Thus they were led away by Amalekiah to dissensions, notwithstanding the preaching of Helaman and his brethren, yea, notwithstanding their exceedingly great care over the church, for they were high priests over their, over the church. Like, why are they pr- prospering in the first place? Like, they are not showing gratitude to what Alma has set up, what Helaman's doing, you know, that's why, because they felt so safe to do wicked things, right? Like, that's why people start getting corrupted. I believe that it's something that people, like, you feel so safe that you're like, oh, I can do anything because I'm so safe. You know, you got that confidence, confidence boost. Okay, so... In the previous chapter, I read this here. It says, for a fascinating study, look up Hugh Nibley's third semester Book of Mormon Lectures by, at BYU. They are found online. He spends four classes on Alma 46 alone and explains that if this chapter was the only one we had, it would be quite enough to prove the Book of Mormon with evidence to convince a person. Hmm. Okay, perfect then. We should definitely make our teens have our teens read it right in verse one we learn that these wealthy people gathered together against helaman i already i don't need it right now sweet thank you 
I can't because it, it, it hits the wall. I can't have it here. I can't do it here anymore. Okay. Um, so they were not just rejecting what Helaman and the others were teaching, but they were so angry that they wanted to slay them. As these church leaders were teaching the gospel, these individuals felt that their way of life was being threatened and they would not, and they would go to any length to protect their riches. Right, of course. This was when a very dangerous and skilled man came forth, a man named Amalekiah. His heart was set on power and he wanted to be a king. So he went about laying the foundation to make this happen. And he did this by flattering others who wanted power, namely some of the lower judges of the land. This was a very dangerous and influential group coming together. Okay, uh, Flora, you can put that back. Just put it back where it goes. Don't just leave it in the middle of the floor, please. It was put away already, and then you're making a mess of it. Honestly. And one hand, uh, oh, sorry. On one hand, we have Helaman and his brethren preaching and laboring and giving exceedingly great care over the church. And on the other hand, we have Amalekiah going around flattering corruptible and powerful people and promising that if they support him in becoming king, he would make them rulers of the people. Vote for Pedro. You know what I mean? No. So there were two opposing forces at work here. Um, how will this affect the Nephites? Who will they choose to support? It is easy to stand on the outside and say, choose Helaman, but Malachi and the judges were some really influential people who were smart and skilled, and they knew exactly what kind of promises and flatteries they could give to the people to gain their favor. Why? Because Satan feeds us these things. And he has tried it for centuries. And it's going to work on us because it's worked on humans before. So here's a quote from Lynn D. Wardle. It says, hey, take it easy, Flora. Quote, it is noteworthy that dissension in the Nephite church was associated with contention in the nation. In other words, there may be a spillover effect. For instance, dissension within the church preceded and perhaps spiritually caused the great civil dissensions that soon plagued the entire Nephite nation as it plunged into a terribly destructive series of wars with the Lamanites who were led and strengthened by Nephite dissenters. End quote. Yeah, that's the worst, you know? So this is Lindy Wardle from a book called Farms. Volume 3, 1994, Spring. Page 69. Okay. Here we go. Verse 7. And there were many in the church who believed in the flattering words of Amalekia, for sure. Therefore, they dissented even from the church, and thus were the affairs of the people of Nephi exceedingly precarious and dangerous, notwithstanding their great victory, which they had had over the Lamanites, and their great rejoicings, which they had had because of their deliverance by the hand of the Lord. Right? They're like forgetting why they are able to have all this free safe time to be wicked, I guess, is how I can put it, to make bad choices. You feel so safe and so entitled and so uh, that you can make bad choices now. You know, like that's just messed up instead of feeling gratitude, right? Thus, we see how quick the children of men do forget the Lord their God, yea, how quick to do iniquity and to be led away by the evil one. Yea, and we also see that great wickedness one very wicked man can cause to take place among the children of men. Yea, we do we see that Amalekiah, because he was a man of cunning, device, and a man of many flattering words, that he led away the hearts of many people to do wickedly, yea, and to seek to destroy the church of God and to destroy the foundation of liberty which God had granted unto them, or which blessing God had sent upon the face of the land for the righteous sake. And now it came to pass that when Moroni was the chief commander of the armies of the Nephites had heard of these dissensions, he was angry with Malachi. For sure, right? Oh, I was just doing this. Yep, this is what I was doing right here. Okay, so verse 7. Would this work the right and right after this terrible war when so many died for their liberties? Yes, it did. Many were... 
blinded by the flattering words of Malachi, and then they left the church. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's so weird. Okay. Um, it says, it could be a really good discussion in your homes to consider what kind of flatteries Malachi might use in order to get people to follow him. What might he promise? What false praise might he give? How might he make people want to leave the church? How would he use his other powerful followers to gain more support? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Mormon makes sure we notice some very important principles. In verse 8, he points out how quickly the children of men do forget the Lord their God, and then they're led away. These Nephites had just come through a war, and they had credited the Lord for delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. But that very next year, they were large numbers of people leaving the church for over something that sounded better right i think it's that i think it is that safety you know when you feel like all is well in zion kind of thing you don't feel your consequences as much and you're when you're not going through hard times you forget right you're just like yes he helped us he blessed us and then you don't go through hard times and then you're like Where's the Lord? You know, when's the last time you said a prayer since that hard time, you know? Um, so, I mean, it, it's hard because we want that consistent relationship with Jesus Christ and not just the, um, what's it called? The vending machine relationship, you know? In verse 9 and 10, Mormon helps us understand who Malachi really was and the damage one man can do. Malachi may have sounded good, and he may have been what people thought they wanted in a leader. But the fruits of his labors were destruction of the church and of liberty. If he were to become king, he would take away some of the, their most precious blessings. So the very things they had just fought for, they were handing over, whether they knew it or not. So, sorry, I'm like, I can't use my little thing because I have a wall here now <laughs> so it's kind of hard so but I need to roll, roll my shoulders so there so here we can see that freedom is not just fought for on a physical battlefield flattering words smooth words and careful plans can be more effective than the sword so through Captain Moroni's example we will also learn the difference a single righteous man can make okay so verses verse 12 to 16 Okay, and it came to pass that he rent his coat, and he took a piece thereof, he wrote upon it in memory of our God, our religion, and freedom, and our peace, our wives, and our children, and he fastened it upon the end of a pole. Oh, that's cute. So, let me see if I can show you what it looks like. This is how they highlighted it in the scriptures. The red-headed host just highlighted it this way. Let me just show you. So the, the verse is highlighted like this in like the little flag formation. And then the pole is like right there. I'm like, that's so cute. You could totally do that in your scriptures. In fact, that's what I need to go do. Because I think that would be awesome. Okay. Um, and he fastened it to on his he head plate and his breastplate and his shields and girded on his armor about his loins. And he took the pole, which had which had on the end thereof his rent coat, and he called it the title of liberty. And he bowed himself to the earth, and he prayed mightily unto his God for the blessings of liberty to rest upon his brethren so long as there should be a band of Christians remain to possess the land. For thus were all the true believers of Christ who belonged to the church of God called by those who did not belong to the church. And, the, and those who did belong to the church were faithful, yea, all those who were true believers in Christ took upon them gladly the name of Christ or Christians as they were called because of their belief in Christ who should come. And therefore, at this time, Moroni prayed that the cause of the Christians and the freedom of the land might be favored. Okay. <clears throat> so, here's a quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. It says, Moroni raised the title of liberty and wrote upon it these words in memory of our god our religion and freedom and our peace our wives and our children why didn't he write upon it just live your religion there's no need to concern yourselves about your freedom 
your peace, your wives, or your children. The reason he didn't do this was because all these things were part of his religion, as they are of our religion today. Should we counsel people, just live your religion? There's no need to get involved in the fight for freedom. No, we should not, because our, because our stand for freedom is a most basic part of our religion. This stand helped get us to this earth, and our reaction to the freedom in this life will have eternal consequences. Man has many duties, but he has no excuse that can compensate for his loss of liberty. As members of the church, we have some close quarters to pass through if we are to gain, if we are going to get some, if we are going to go, if we are going to get home safely. <sighs> We will, be get, we will be given a chance to choose between conflicting counsel given by some. That's why we must learn, and the sooner we learn, the better, to keep our eye on the prophet, the president of the church, end quote. So good. Uh, Ezra, president Ezra Taft Benson, October 1966 General Conference. So good. Okay, so then, verse 17 to 19, 17 to... And it came to pass that when he had poured out his soul to God, he named all the land, which was south of the land desolation, yea, and in fine all the land, both on the north and on the south, a chosen land and the land of and the land of liberty. And he said, Surely God shall not suffer that we who are despised because we take upon us the name of Christ shall be trodden down and destroyed until we bring it upon us by our own transgressions. And when Moroni had said these words, he went forth among the people, waving the rent part of his garment in the air, that all might see the writing which he had written upon the rent part, and crying with a loud voice, saying, so this is the call, the invitation, Behold, whosoever will maintain this title upon the land, let them come forth in the strength of the Lord, and enter into a covenant that they will maintain their rights and their religion, and that the Lord God may bless them. And it came to pass that when Moroni had proclaimed these words, behold, the people came running together with their armor girded about their loins, renting their garments in token, in token or as a covenant, that they would not forsake the Lord their God. Or in other words, if they should transgress the commandments of God or fail into trans, fall into transgression and be ashamed to take upon them the name of Christ, the Lord should rend them even as they had rent their garments. Wow. Okay. That's wild. Okay, so President, so we're on 22. President Ezra Taft Benson, October 1979 General Conference said, Never before has the land of Zion appeared so vulnerable to so powerful an enemy as the American, as the Americans do at present. And our vulnerability is directly attributed to our loss of active faith in God, in the God of this land, who has decreed that we must worship him or be swept off. Too many Americans have lost sight of the truth that God is our source of freedom. Ooh, yes, the lawgiver. And that personal righteousness is the most important essential to preserving our freedom. End quote. Yeah, that's an amazing quote. Like, that should be like on the flat, like the United States American flag. Uh, President Ezra Taft Benson, October 1979, General Conference. Woo! So... Now, verse 22. Now, this was the covenant, which, hold on. Hold on a second. I need a drink. Okay, verse 22. Now, this was the covenant which they made, and they cast their garments at the feet of Moroni, saying, We covenant with our God that we shall be destroyed, even as our brethren in the land northward. If we shall fall into transgression, yea, may he may cast us at the feet of our enemies, even as we have cast our garments at thy feet to be trodden underfoot, if we shall fall into transgression. So they're making serious promises about them not falling into transgression, which I love because it takes it takes that courage to like make covenants and promises uh, to the Lord. You know, sometimes you make additional covenants and promises to the Lord. Um, and I think that's awesome. You know, you've probably had those promises and covenants made in desperate needs during your life, you know, and I know I have. And kind of sad because sometimes those covenants you're like oops i kind of did not go uh did not complete my part of the bargain right 
And so, so yeah, it's definitely something that we need to work on, I think, or I, I need to work on. Um, but I love that they were able to take extra, make extra covenants with the Lord. Okay, verse 23. I'm, I don't know if you can notice, but in my mind, I'm like, what are some covenants that I promised that I have not kept my part of the bargain? So I'm thinking through some of those and feeling a little bit sad. Okay, Moroni said unto them, Behold, we are a remnant of the seed of Jacob. Yea, we are a remnant of the seed of Joseph, whose coat was rent by the brethren into, by his brethren into many pieces. Yea, and now behold, let us remember to keep the commandments of God, or our garments shall be rent by our brethren. And be and we be cast into prison, or be sold, or be slain. Oh, that's a good, like a good consequence, good analogy, good remembering. Yea, let us preserve our liberty as a remnant of Joseph. Yea, let us remember the words of Jacob before his death. For behold, he saw that a part of the remnant of the coat of Joseph was preserved and had not decayed. And he said, even as this remnant of, remnant of garment of my son hath been preserved, so shall a remnant of the seed of my son be preserved by the hand of God and be taken unto himself while the remainder of the seed of Joseph shall perish even as the remnant of his garment and behold this he give this, now behold this giveth my soul sorrow nevertheless my soul hath joy in my son because of that part of his seed which shall be taken unto God maybe I just need to eat something I don't know <sighs> now behold this was the language of Jacob and now who knoweth but what the remnant of the seed of Joseph, wait, but what the remnant of the seed of Joseph, which shall perish as his garment, are, the, are those who have dissented from us. Yea, and even it shall, uh-oh, do not go that fast. <laughs> Press number seven or something. Like That would have been bad. Okay, um, where was I? And now who knoweth but what the remnant of the seed of Joseph, which shall perish, as his garment are those who have dissented from us. Yea, and even it shall be ourselves if we do not stand fast in the faith of Christ. So they're saying like, hey, if we don't stand fast, we're going to be, we're going to be stuck. You know, we're going to be missing out and we're going to be just like, we're not going to be the remnant, but we're going to be the pieces that were, that were destroyed. Verse 28, and now it came to pass that when Moroni had said these words, he went forth and also sent forth in all the parts of the land where there were dissensions and gathered together all the people who were desirous to maintain their liberty to stand against the Malachiah and those who had dissented who were called the Malachiites. And it came to pass that when Amalekiah saw that the people of Moroni were more numerous than Amalekiahites, and he saw that his people were doubtful concerning the justice of the cause in which they had undertaken, therefore Fearing that he should not gain the point, he took those of his people who would who would and departed into the land of Nephi. So the Lamanite land. Okay, sounds great, Miss. Oh, I'm so excited. Flora wanted to paint. So something I love about Moroni is that he was just so courageous. He was like not sugarcoating anything. He was telling it how he how he believed it, and he was trying to gather people from everywhere and he was going to different places, not just the safe places where he would be safe, but he was going in the heat of the battle, the heat of like discussions and uh, debates and things. And he was trying to gather people who believed in what he believed and in that liberty so that he could know where the Christians were. Right. Um, and so, of course, since they know, since Amalekiah was noticing his, that their, his numbers were going down, you know, he needed to move out of the land. He needed to get out, right? Because now not very many people believe Amalekiah. So he's like, well, I'm going to take whoever I can and, and leave because that's what cowards do. Okay, they leave. When they can't take the heat, they get out the kitchen. All right, so verse 30. Now Moroni thought it was not expedient that the Lamanites should have any more strength. Therefore, he thought to cut off the people of Amalekiah or to take them and bring them back and put Amalekiah to death. For he knew that he would stir up the Lamanites to anger against them and cause them to come to battle against them. And this he knew that Amalekiah would do, that he might obtain his purposes. So I wonder if Helaman told Moroni 
what the prophecy was, you know? And maybe that's why he was so, like, determined. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. Therefore, Moroni thought it was expedient that he should take his armies who had gathered themselves together and armed themselves and entered into a covenant to keep the peace. And it came to pass that he took his army and marched out with his tents into the wilderness to cut off the course of Amalekiah in the wilderness. Well, we know that Amalekiah was already trying to kill peeps because that's what they said. Um, and so it wasn't like Moroni was trying to kill them for no reason. Um, there was a reason and to keep his life, right? Because if Amalekai goes to the Nephites now, or to the Lamanites now, now they get stronger and um, that's not cool. So, and because he already knows that the Lamanites want to kill him. So like, it's just, it's all bad, right? Okay. And then it says, verse 32. So, course of Amalekai in the wilderness, okay, 32. And it came to pass that he did according to his desires and marched forth into the wilderness and headed the armies of Amalekai. And it came to pass that Amalekai fled with a small number of his men, and the remainder were delivered up into the hands of Moroni and were taken back into the land of Zarahemla. Now Moroni, being a man who was appointed by the chief judges and the voice of the people, therefore he had power according to his will with the armies of the Nephites to establish and to exercise authority over them. So he's like the big guy in charge, you know. And it came to pass that whomsoever the Amalekites that would not enter into a covenant to support the cause of freedom, that they might maintain a free government, he caused to be put to death. And there were but few who denied the covenant of freedom. And it came to pass that pass also that he caused the title of liberty to be hoisted upon every tower which was in the land, which was possessed by the Nephites. And thus Moroni planted the standard of liberty among the Nephites. And so, you know, because they were not having the same goals and because they were trying to hurt them oh no i feel like i think i missed reading a bunch of stuff because i forgot to press start again okay so now i don't know where we're at let me see okay that's really sad so apparently i stopped recording at 32. ugh i don't know why it stops recording i think the spammers that call sometimes make my recording stop so Okay, and it came to pass that he did according to his desires and marched forth into the wilderness and headed the armies of Malachi. And it came to pass that Malachi fled with a small number of his men. And the remainder were delivered up into the hands of Moroni and were taken back into the land of Zarahemla. Now Moroni, being a man who was appointed by the chief judges and the voice of the people, therefore he had power according to his will with the armies of the Nephites to establish and to exercise authority over them. So it makes sense that uh, Moroni is trying to take these guys out um, or convert them because they could be a threat to their land, right? And he was hoping to get Amalekiah also. And it came to pass that whomsoever the Amalekiahites that would not enter into a covenant to support the cause of freedom, that they might maintain a free government, he caused to be put to death. And there were but few who denied the covenant of freedom. And it came to pass that he caused the title of liberty to be hoisted upon every tower which was in the, all the land, which was possessed by the Nephites. And thus Moroni planted the standard of liberty among the Nephites. Yes, because we need those reminders, right? And they began to have peace again in the land. And thus they did maintain peace in the land until nearly the end of the 19th year of the reign of the judges. And Helaman and the high priests did also maintain order in the church, yea, even for the space of four years did they have much peace and rejoicing in the church. And it came to pass that there were many who died firmly believing that their souls were redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus they went out of the world rejoicing. And there were some who died with fevers, which at some seasons of the year were very frequent in the land, but not so much so with fevers because of the excellent qualities of the many plants and roots which God had prepared to remove the cause of diseases to which men were subject by the nature of the climate. But there were many who died with old age and those who died in the faith of Christ are happy in him as we must needs suppose. Okay, so there's a couple quotes. So President Ezra Taft Benson quoted this scripture, verse 36, and then said, this is our need today to plant the standard of liberty among our people throughout the Americas, end quote. And this is from a, title, a talk titled, A Witness and a Warning, October 1962 General Conference. And President Ezra Taft Benson was in the Quorum of the Twelve from 1943 to 1985, then President of the Church from 
1985 to 1994. During this time, during his time as an apostle, he was on President Dwight D. Eisenhower's cabinet as Secretary of Agriculture from 1953 to 1961. So for eight years, and as an apostle, Ezra Taft Benson was immersed in the United States government. You will find that many of President Benson's talks upon his return were warnings about losing our liberties and the dangerous forces at work, including that quote above, which was that the year after he returned. In fact, in that same talk, he said, here it is, I testify to you that God's hand has been in our destiny. I testify that freedom as we know it today is being threatened as never before in our history. I further witness that this land, the Americas, must be protected, its constitution upheld, for this is a land foreordained to be the Zion of our God. He expects us, as members of the church to and bearers of his priesthood, to do all we can to preserve our liberty." End quote. This is Ezra Taft Benson, a witness and a warning, October 1962, General Conference. Okay, so I love this so much. And side note, uh, uh, President Benson's wife's name is Flora, and he was always talking so sweetly about her. And one of the talks we listened to um, during our IVF journey, um, I heard him talk about his wife, and his wife's name's Flora. And we were like, that is totally, I was like, that's totally her name. That's our daughter's name. Her name's Flora. And it's wild to have little Flora today. So anyway, pretty awesome. So now there will be peace in the land for a bit, but it will not last because Amalekiah is now among the Lamanites. And we didn't want that happening, but since cowards flee, he left. And uh, the Lamanites are still at work, uh, or he's still at work with the Lamanites to gain power that he desires, right? So this is not the last time we will hear about him. So what lengths does Moroni go to in order to secure their liberties? I love that he went into every place to secure liberties. And what lengths does Malachiah go to in order to gain power? Uh, he also did all that, um, but then he also left. And what can we learn from this chapter? Why do you think this chapter is important for us to know in these last days? What lessons have stood out most to you in this chapter? And what can you and your family do to preserve your liberties? Why must you do so? Okay, and then our read it libit is right here. And it says, let's stop here. It says, the people of the church in Moroni's day were called Christians because they took upon them gladly the name of Christ. Live a Christian life. Take his name gladly. Ooh, I love that. All right, um, until Alma chapter 47, stay strong, warrior.